Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Uh, we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Again, thank you all for coming back today. I thought I was going to be in here by myself today. But uh, I am super grateful for this invitation again to Pastor Angela Wilson, uh, to Khadijah Kelly. Uh, my comments yesterday to Khadijah were meant to uh, highlight the incredible giftedness, brilliance, and genius and strength of black women. And uh, I think that it's important that I clarify that and say that in front of you guys today. Uh, I know that there are marginalized people all over the world, but black women, women like Khadijah, who carry the torch uh, so faithfully with such class and charisma uh, need to be acknowledged. And so I want to get that right today and, uh, and say we honor you. This morning, I want to read into your hearing a passage from the end of Matthew's Gospel. I want to take a kind of anamorphic view on the notion of our love for the church. I'm aware that some of us just sang that song and we were just singing lyrics. We are no more in love with the church as Beyonce is in love with me. Um, however, I want to submit to you this morning that there is reason for you and I to love the church. I want to take a side angle of vision, if I can, and speak to this thing. Matthew 28, beginning at verse 16, the Bible says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything, all things that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Therein reads the word of our God. Let me breathe a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you now for clarity of mind, for concision of speech and conviction of heart. Help me to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth for your glory and for the good of your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. 1636 was the year the school started with the express purpose to instructed students to know God and to know Christ. They originally only hired confessional Christians as professors. That was their original intent. But in 1987, its president of this looming, largely, gloriously reputed school stood up and said that they had strayed so far from their original roots that they were wholly secular and had nothing to do with an intent to teach students to know God and to know Christ. Oh, it's a small school in Boston, Massachusetts. None of you have ever heard of it before. It might start with the letter H and end with the letter D. They drifted from their mission. Yes. It's not only with schools, but it's also with foundations. His name is Howard Pugh. He was an oil tycoon who amassed a significant fortune, and he and his family decided that they would set up a foundation to release those funds to institutions and movements that were expressly Christian. But after his demise in 1971, the Pugh Foundation began to fund other organizations that had nothing to do with Christ, yeah. nothing to do with advancing his kingdom. And they drifted because when a founder dies, organizations are susceptible to moving away from their mission. We, we see that not only with Harvard, not only with the Pew Foundation, but maybe, uh, and, you, and you guys are so young, you might not fully appreciate this. When I was growing up, I went to a small Christian school on the south side of Chicago, and we didn't have a gymnasium. So our phys ed courses were taught at the local 
YMCA. And at the YMCA, we learned that this organization was started by George Williams in London, England to help displaced men prepare for missions. And they were the Young Men's Christian Association. Well, over time, they got more into health and fitness and more into health and fitness and less about disciple making and more into health and fitness until they ended up dropping three of their four letters. And, and now rather than being the YMCA, they are the Y. And they leave us asking the question, why? Yeah. Yeah. It's because you can do a good thing and it still not be the best thing that you were made to do. When a founder dies, the organization tends to drift and to shift away from its original mission. And I raise that up for your consideration and mine to ask this question, how is it that after the founder of the church died, that we're still in business, still doing what we were designed to do? How is it that, that the church has outlast empires and civilizations? How is it that amid persecution and marginalization, the church has continued to grow, even with all of its flaws? I want to submit to you, it is because its founder is not dead. Amen. Amen. It is because he is the risen, resurrected, reigning Lord. Yes, sir. And when we meet him in Matthew 28, he has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he's standing before his disciples and he's commissioning them, this fledgling motley group. They were 11-ish. Yeah. Yeah. He's saying to them, all power in heaven and in earth is in my hands. Go therefore to all nations and teach them all things. And I am with you always. Whatever your problem is about the church, it ain't a problem with Jesus. Right, right, right. And the reason the church is here and the reason the church is gonna outlive us if the Lord shall tarry is because its founder still has all power. Yes, sir. Still has all authority. Still moving. I want to submit to you today that this text is tailored to teach us that the authority of the risen, resurrected Lord enables the mission of the church. Yes, sir. And for that reason, we ought to stick with the church. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, I just said something there. Mm -hmm. I said that the authority of the risen, re resurrected Lord, look at how this authority of the risen, resurrected Lord contrast with the frail, faulty faith of the disciples. See, whenever you fix your gaze upon the disciples and not upon Jesus, you'll fall out of love with the church. Look at how this works here. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Here it is, these 11-ish disciples. And the way the grammar is written, it's more than 11 of them. We know that more than 500 people saw Jesus resurrected from the grave at one time. We, we know that this mountain has a lot of people there. You can feel his authority even in this preamble of ambiguity and apprehension. Uh, I name it such because they are frail and faulty, but he's strong and secure. Yes, sir. He says, meet me at this mountain. He sounds like, in a sense, ways we've never heard him sound before. Authoritative, yes, sir. strong, commanding. Yes, sir. Have you ever noticed, by the way, when he gives them this mountain to meet him at, that Jesus did some of his best ministry on mountains? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. You remember when Jesus was tempted in Matthew chapter 4, on a mountain. I know I just said something you don't register at all because none of you looked at me any different. You act like I didn't say anything to you at all. So I'm going to circle the wagon right back. Did you hear what I just said? Jesus was tempted? Yeah. Oh yeah. He's tempted on a mountain. Uh -huh. And yet on that mountain, he victoriously overcomes that temptation. Or how about when Jesus preached and fed the multitudes on a mountain? Yeah. In Matthew chapter 5. 
How, how about when Jesus was gloriously transfigured in Matthew 17 on this mountain yes. and Peter, James, and John are saying, oh my goodness, we've never seen anything like this before. Or, or that mountain where he gave his life, nails in his hands, yes, a spear in his side, a crown of thorn upon his head, and now he comes to another mountain. Yes, sir. It is the Mount of Mission. And he says, meet me here. I got something I want to say to you. But, but the preamble to the Great Commission is significant to interpreting the Great Commission because there's some ambiguity here, some apprehension. For anybody and everybody who struggles with faith in Jesus from time to time, this is your text. The Bible says that they worshiped him, but some doubted. Yes, sir. How can you worship and doubt at the same time? Don't let anybody make you think or feel like because you got questions, you are not a Christian. Listen, some of the great people uh, throughout history who've walked with the Lord have had significant questions. Yes, this, this word doubted is the same word that shows up in Acts chapter 10 when Peter uh, doesn't want to eat uh, ham hocks, pig feet, chitlins, rib tips, and bacon. And it all comes down to him on a sheet, and, and Peter says, no, Lord, I cannot eat that. And the Lord says to him, don't you call unclean what I've called clean. And he, he says to them, now there's some men at the gate who I want you to go with. Go with them without doubt, yes. without hesitation. That, that this text says that, that the resurrection was so amazing that the disciples worshiped, but they were hesitant to believe. Wow. Friends, listen to me. It is possible for doubt and faith, for hesitation and belief to coexist in the same heart. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ask Mother Teresa. Ask Charles Spurgeon. Ask, ask those who have had the dark night of the soul. Can I tell you something? The moment you think you're so smart that you got God all figured out, you're in trouble. There ought to be some kind of reservation in your heart where you don't have everything figured out and it makes you wonder. Frederick Buchner called doubt the ants in the pants of faith. That doubt nips at us and prompts us to believe. But what this says to me in a preaching point is that God uses imperfect people uh -huh. to do his perfect work in the world. My, my, my. That the church is not comprised of perfect people. Yes. And if you ever find a church where everybody is perfect, don't join it. Yeah. Yeah. You'll mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> These disciples are looking at Jesus and saying, we're not sure about you. But Jesus is looking at them saying, I'm sure about y'all. Mm. I want to say to you today, friends, that don't you let your own faults and failures or the faults and failures of others who serve the church slow you down in your love and affection for it. I like the way Beyonce said it. 2007, y'all probably three years old then, she came out with this song called Flaws and All. I'm a train wreck in the morning, she said. I'm a witch in the afternoon. She, she says, oh, but, but you somehow find a way to put all the pieces of my puzzle together in a clear picture. I love you because you love me, flaws and all. I can get with that. Can I tell y'all, I know the church got flaws. I know pastors got flaws. I know there are challenges and everybody and their mama want to know what the pastor's challenges are, even though they don't want to tell their own challenges. I, I get it that, that the church has, but can I tell you what's not going to stop me from loving the church? Somebody else's flaws. I'm going to love the church because the church is the institution where Jesus gives his life and his love for us, flaws and all. Yes, sir. Can I tell you another reason I'm sticking with the church and I love the church is because the church is for all people. Yes. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority, that's one, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's two, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all things. That's three that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you all the days to the end of the age. I just saw my buddy, Dr. Esau McCauley, uh, uh, come in, a New Testament professor, and, and you know, he know Greek real good. And so every now and then I like, I study real good. 
so I can be ready when I preach in front of people who know this stuff. And so I did a word study on pas, pasapan, on, on the original language of the words for all. Can I tell y'all something? I got a deep revelation. Right. Don't tell nobody I told you this. I studied the word all, and you know what I found out? That, that all means in the original Koine Greek, all means all. <laughs> I want you to feel this now. All means exhausted. There is nothing on the other side of all. Uh, Jesus is stating his exclusivity here. He's saying that when you're done with my authority and my dominion, uh, there is none left over. I got it. All. Yeah. And, and the beauty of, in this text is that Jesus says all authority. Uh, there are two words, dominating words in the Koine Greek that, that give us the translation all. One is dunamis, power. The other is exousia, authority. Dunamis is, is a power. It's gone on, on your hip. Uh, power, authority, exousia is a badge on your chest. You, you can have power, but if you don't have authority, yeah. it doesn't really mean anything. My father was a criminal deputy down in Natchez, Mississippi for a while, and he had a firearm. He was coming to visit us, and I joked with him, saying, you come to Chicago, uh, you want to bring that thing with you? He said, man, I can't bring that thing with me. I said, why not? He said, man, my jurisdiction is down here. And even though I'm the law down here, I'll get in trouble with the law up there if I don't leave it down here. What he was saying to me is he has limited jurisdiction, limited authority. When Jesus stands up in front of his disciples, he says, I have all jurisdiction. Yes, sir. Every grave belongs to me. Yes, sir. Every president belongs to me. Yes, sir. Every news outlet is mine. China, uh -huh. under my authority. Yes, sir. Japan, uh -huh. under my authority. Russia, uh -huh. under my authority. Those yet to be United States, under my authority. What he's saying to his disciples is, y'all ain't got to be afraid of nobody or no thing, because wherever you go, I'm in charge. I like the way my daughter helped me to feel this. One time I went to a room and she went through the street where everything was hers, you know? And, uh, and I would laugh. I went to grab something. She said, Daddy, that's mine. And I know me and her mama bought it. So I'm trying to figure out when did she get so possessive? So I, st I started to play with her. I said, uh, that, that pillow over there, mine. So I said, Claire, how about this rocking chair? Mine, Daddy. And I went to grab a water bottle. She got attitude. She said, mine. When Jesus looks out over the world, you know what he says? Mine. Wheaton College? Mine. Yes, sir. Chicago, Illinois? Mine. The White House? Mine. He's got all authority and all power. And he says, on the basis of that, go into all nations. The gospel, the church, is not just for rich people. Uh -huh. It's not just for poor people. It's not just for white people. It's not just for black people. It's not just for women. It's not just for men. But this thing is for everybody. Yes, and you and I would do well when you graduate to go out and have a global perspective of the church. Yes, sir. Don't you look at the American church and get an attitude. You know that the church is blowing up in other parts of the world and America is well behind. Yes, sir. This enterprise is far beyond these yet to be United yes, States. Sir. I'm done. I only got three minutes. Actually, I'm not done again. I am out of time again. I will stop right here when I tell you this. I love the church flaws and all. I love the church because it's for all. I love the church because it's the only institution God pledges his personal presence. He says, go out into the whole nation and make disciples. This isn't just winning souls. The dominating controlling verb in this text is to win them and to build them up and to send them out. To be a disciple is to be a learner, a student. To be a disciple maker is to be a teacher. Yes, sir. But the only way this happens is that we have to have the unmitigated presence of Jesus with us as we go. Yes, now take my word for it. You can read it in a book or you can listen to me tell you. I have been pastoring long enough to tell you 
I know Jesus is with his church. Yes. Yes. I didn't been through pastoring a church where on one Sunday we had the largest attendance we had had in a long time, and the next week nobody was in church because COVID had shut the thing down. Yes, sir. I preached the cameras for a year and a half, not knowing if anybody on the other side was even listening. I've come through seasons where even in my own struggle, when my mother passed away, in my own personal heartaches and toils, I needed help to stand up to preach. And I can tell you that there have been times where I stood up and I knew I wasn't standing by myself. Yes, sir. There's somebody with me and there's somebody with the church and his presence makes all the difference in the world. Yes, sir. And that'll never matter to you until you come to the end of yourself. I went to see Stevie Wonder one night. Don't tell nobody. I, don't judge me. Um, I, went, I went with my pastor who happens to know him. And uh, we, he was playing at Northerly Island. And we were in two separate cars. Me and Kiersey were in a car. In one car, Pastor Meeks and his wife and his daughter were in a car up ahead. And we had got off of Lakeshore Drive and we were going into Northerly Island. And when we pulled up to parking, I realized I didn't have any cash. I'm barely a millennial. I might not be, but you know, I don't carry cash like y'all. And they were only taking cash that night. So I was trying to figure out my speech. How was I going to get out of this? How was I going to say, could y'all let me turn around and go find an ATM and get back? So I pull up, I lower my window, and I'm about to give my speech. I don't have the money. When the agent looks at me and says, are you Charlie Dates? I said, yeah. He said, uh, the guy in front of you said you with him. I said, I am. He said, come on through. My, my, my. Yeah, on a, that's on a lower, lesser, lighter level. I got to a place where I could not get in and my insufficiency uh -huh. was on clear display. But because I was with somebody, mm who had the resources and the connections. Yes, the agent just waved me through. Y'all ain't in here with me, so I'm gonna close my sermon by saying this to you. You gonna have some moments in your life where you're gonna be insufficient for the task at hand. Yes, sir. Where, where the weight of the world will be upon you and all the resources you got will not be enough to get you through. Tuck this away like a pearl in the pocket of your heart. Remember what I'm saying to you for when that moment comes. When you get to that moment, uh -huh. I want you to remember it was never your resources that got you through. Yes, sir. It was never your mama and daddy's money that got you through. It was, it was never your connection. It's that you got somebody with you uh -huh. who's got all authority and all power. And when he's with you, Hey, you're going to be all right.